Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. I am so excited that you are joining me this week, as I always am. I am a registered holistic nutritionist and biohacker and content creator at this point. And yeah, every week I bring on new guests who go through their health journey and what they're doing in the world and their products, startups or businesses or whatever they're doing. So if you've been here before, welcome back. And if you're new, we are super excited. I am super excited to have you listening. This week has been really good. It feels like February kind of has a new energy to it, which is really nice. Like January felt a bit heavy and just like very long winded winded and yeah, I don't know. Like it just, I think, and I don't know if other people felt like this too, but it just kind of dragged on and deep in the winter. It just feels like there's not much to look forward to, but now in February, things feel lighter, like spring is on the way and I have some exciting things coming up. So feeling much better about things. I briefly want to talk about microdosing actually, because I talked about this on Instagram this week and last week, and I had quite a lot of people reach out. So I have microdosed with psilocybin before, and I think it was last year, I had a couple different brands send me their mushrooms or their mushroom stacks. And it It was interesting. I did it for a little bit, but never really got into it. And then I just had a new company send me some, and I've been really into it this time around, which is interesting. And it's a very small dosage. So the what I'm taking right now is 75 milligrams, which is very small and is actually the smallest dosage that this company offers. And inside the mushrooms, inside the supplement, there's other things added as well. So the one I took today has cordyceps in it, ashwagandha, maca, ginkgo bilboa, bee pollen, Siberian ginseng, and ginger. And it's cool because these are adaptogens and these are things that are different types of, yeah, some of them are mushrooms as well, but it's really nice to just take psilocybin with other ingredients in it as a very like holistic supplement and holistic protocol. So it's been interesting to experiment with them. And yeah, I've just kind of yeah, it's just weird. I This company sent me new ones, so I'm trying it again. And some of my favorite podcasters that I listen to are super into microdosing right now as well. And I'm kind of seeing it everywhere. So it's just kind of this thing that is kind of popping up everywhere that I'm looking. And I've started doing some research. So kind of looking at the benefits and looking at how it can impact your health. Now, like when you're microdosing, like with such a small amount, you're not hallucinating. You're not like not aware of what's going on, right? There's a lot, there's a lot that you're aware of and you can be productive and you can work and do these things. So because it's such a tiny amount, but there's a variety of benefits and both short term, like in the moment and also long term. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to do a full podcast on microdosing with psilocybin because it's it's there's a lot to talk about and i feel like i want to give a very like educational episode on it and my experience but i'm going to wait until about a month from now so i can talk better to my experience and make better recommendations right now i think i'm going to do about like one day on one day off maybe 4 days a week something like that like not every single day but enough to notice a difference in it so if you are in Canada and you're interested in microdosing with psilocybin, reach out to me on Instagram and I will send you a couple of the brands that I've tried. It's different in the US or other places, obviously, because shipping is a issue and psilocybin and mushrooms are not legal at this point. I think there's a couple places in the States that they are legal. I think it might be like the state of Oregon and there might be another one, but it's definitely not at the point of like cannabis now, which is legal. Uh, in Canada. So yeah. So if you want to get your hands on them and you're, you've been thinking about microdosing for a long time, just message me and, and I will give, get you in touch with the right people. Cause I know the people now, so I am happy to help and look out for that episode. I'm really excited about it actually. And I've started doing, I've even started researching psilocybin for hormonal health and like how that impacts the menstrual cycle and an ovulation and your period and all of these different things. Like as a female biohacker, I'm always curious 
how biohacks impact females specifically. Yes, it can create like better mood. That's great. But can it help alleviate PMS symptoms? When you're on your period, if you take psilocybin in a microdose, will it help reduce cramping? All of these different things, like I'm just wondering. So I started reading some blog posts and kind of going down this rabbit hole. So I will put that into an episode and let you know what I find. Today's episode is with Sensate, the founder, I think it's the founder of Sensate. And this is really cool because we talk about like vibrational therapy on the body and activating the vagus nerve. And if you have been following me for a while on Instagram, I love Sensate. I started using them last summer and we get all into the science of it and why to use it and how to use it and how it helps even kids and teens and different things like that. And it was a pretty interesting episode, actually. I, I learned a lot. So I'm excited that you're listening. And a quick shout out to this week's uh, sponsor for the show, it, which is Coast. I love their supplements because they have a NAD plus activator or I guess precursor in their supplement, which is NM NMN. And they also have a glutathione precursor. So these are uh, really important antioxidants in the body, really good for detoxing, and it's kind of hard to find quality supplements that have these ingredients. I haven't seen a lot of them and definitely not ones that are in a powder form. And I love a powder form because I drink so much water or try to, I try and drink a gallon a day, which is 3.8 liters. And so whenever supplements come in a powder form, I'm so happy because it makes me drink my water faster. It makes the water taste good. And then it gets my supplements in. So definitely love them. And so check them out if you've been interested in kind of further detoxing or doing some sort of uh, supplement for recovery or a glutathione antioxidant type of idea. And enjoy this week. Next week, I am, will still be here. <laughs> I'm here every week, but I'm, I'm heading to Costa Rica at the end of this month. So I am so excited for that. I haven't had a vacation like that since 2019. I haven't left Canada since 2019 and for obvious reasons. So I will probably just bring an episode from there and talk about my experience there as well. So yeah, stay tuned for that. And again, if you are interested in microdosing, just message me on Instagram and we can chat further. And Or if you have any other health questions or brands that you want me to check out or have opinion on or want me to work with, or if you are a brand and you're looking to work with biohackers, let me know. My inbox is always open. My DMs are always open. And yeah, I look forward to chatting and I hope you enjoy this episode. Okay. Welcome to a, another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. I am thrilled that you are joining me today. This is a cool episode because we are diving into Sensate, which is a device that I have been using for, I don't know, maybe like six months, maybe almost a year now. And I've definitely talked about it on social media before. So we actually have the inventor and the founder on the show today to explain the history of it, how he kind of got started with it, and really like the science behind it and how it works and how we can benefit from it. So welcome to the show. Brittany, thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. So let's start with you and your health journey, like prior to Sensate and, and everything that you've developed. What kind of like got you started on this healing and holistic health journey that you're on? Yeah, well, it's, it's a combination of a lifelong experience. And I guess Sensate is the culmination of that, but also the last 30 years as an integrated healthcare physician. So I was um, brought up in a household where a lot of things that would have been called alternative at the time are now pretty mainstream. So Eastern philosophy and Buddhism and eating kind of whole foods. And dad taught me and my brother to meditate at a very, very early age. So I've been meditating for a very long time with various teachers and retreats along the way. And that has always been part of how I see the world and how I work with patients. So for the last 30 years, I've been working as an integrated healthcare physician. So I've found a new medicine group in London's Harley Street. And we were the UK's main integrated healthcare team, 300 years of clinical experience within the team at, at one point. And our speciality was seeing 
patients who had seen everyone and done everything and us finding holistic solutions to their problems. Uh, my main interest with those people was to uh, get them to be able to manage stress better because my conclusion after many clinical years was that it was the dysregulation of stress hormones that caused so many of the inflammatory and chronic preventable diseases that we see. And so my obsession really has always been about getting people to meditate and breathe properly. And Sensate, therefore, is really provides two, two purposes. One, I really noticed uh, a number of years ago, that people's ability to engage with the classical meditation breathing techniques had really become harder and harder. And, and I think you know we can blame many things for that technology amongst them, but it's not. It's more complex than just that. But also the number of people I could reach in an upmarket London clinic was limited. And at this stage in my career, I'm really all about the impact. And my interest now is in reaching hundreds of millions of people and being part of what I think is a global movement to enable people to take better charge of their lives, control their health and become better at managing stress so that they can obviously improve their health and their mental health and their physical health and the quality of the decisions they make. Yeah, I just want to go back to when you said the dysregulation of stress hormones are you specifically referring to like cortisol and it not being on like the natural curve that it should be where it's like higher in the morning, lower at night? Or is there like more at play there that, that you've seen? Yes, yeah, so there's cortisol regu regulation, cortisol curves, adrenaline, norepinephrine. And I think what if we dig down, what, was, what we certainly found in New Medicine Group is if you dig down into the chronic inflammatory preventable diseases, which are now responsible for most people's health issues in the developed world, is that inflammation does underlie most of these issues. Yeah, so from heart disease and obesity, diabetes, cancer, inflammatory diseases, immune system suppression, the connection between the, the, the gut brain and the mind brain, what you invariably find is dysreg dysregulation of, of these stress hormones leading to inflammation. And this, this isn't that weird because, of course, the hormones we're talking about, particularly adrenaline, norepinephrine, are designed from an evolutionary biological point of view to give us superpowers over a very short period of time, right? So they give they turn us into momentary superheroes, or that's what they're designed to do, to give you the ability to fight, fight, flee, freeze, or fall in a survival situation. I think the issue is that these hormones are being prodded and released uh, in a way that we never evolved. To have them function and uh, the way they give us these superpowers is by having these sort of supercharging superheating and therefore inflammatory actions which is fine short term if you need to run away or fight but is obviously very corrosive and harmful long term mm -hmm. do you find that like your typical clients like back then or i guess like even now would have an overproduction of this because I, like I see clients in my practice too as a nutritionist and there's definitely people who are kind of like go, go, go all the time. But sometimes like these types of hormones can actually just flatline and then they're just tired and fatigued and they've gone through that whole time of being supercharged and now they just have no production or very low production. Yeah, you certainly see that. And we talk about there's been a lot of discussion of you know adrenal fatigue and how that factors into chronic fatigue syndrome or um, post viral syndrome. And of course, it, it, we, we can't take one hormone in isolation. They're all, all the endocrine system that produces the hormones is all interlinked. So there's obviously a, a spillover and an impact on sex hormones, brain chemicals, etc, as well. So you know, because we are we don't want to go off too much of a tangent, but obviously, we're also seeing a epidemic of problems in fertility, male and female, as well, and not just fertility, but also gynecological, you know, menstrual problems in general, irregular periods, uh, endometriosis, etc. So, and which also can be aspects, certainly of which can be seen as being stress related and stress hormone dysregulation related. So, I'm not a great fan of measuring and identifying one hormone or even a couple of hormones uh, or treating one or two hormones in isolation because it's a kind of closed system. And if you stick um, something on one end of the scale, even if you balance up the thing that's uh, maybe deficient, you're likely to throw something else off. Uh, and I, I like to take a holistic approach. And that's why the uh, working on the autonomic nervous system, of which the biggest branch is the vagus nerve, uh, speaks to me so strongly. 
because um, from what I can see, uh, from what the team kind of found over many years of looking at lots of patients with chronic problems, was that that's the regulatory mechanism for so much of what goes on within the body and particularly what goes on within the organs, within the viscera. Yeah, I, I love that. And I agree. I think the holistic approach tends to work much better than kind of just looking at like adrenal fatigue and take this one supplement and it's going to fix it. <laughs> and then everything else will be fixed, you know? Yeah. So, and I know Sensei, that's very much built into philosophy and the work that you do. But for, for people listening, whether they're biohackers or not, how would they know just like from like simple day-to-day symptoms, like how would they know if their stress hormonal system is kind of out of whack? Like what would you say would be like obvious signs? Yeah, there are biomarkers, which are proxies for vagal tone. For Because you know, I do strongly believe that the tone of the vagus nerve is the ultimate metric. I think it underlies so much of our important physiology. So, you know, heart rate variability, the amount of CO2, O2 in the, in the air that you're breathing in and out, heart rate, core body temperature. There's lots of, um, there's lots of individual markers which give you part of the story and you know, taken in combination, as many biohackers might do, then they, they give you quite a big proportion of the story as well. So for those who are inclined, you can take biomarkers and that can help. But, you know, if I'm going to be really honest, one of the things I've, one of the biggest lessons I can pass on after three decades in healthcare is how you feel is one of the most important indicators about how you're doing. So I'm a big believer in, in a marker called subjective well-being, which is, you know, and actually it has huge amounts of scientific support that's been validated in numerous studies and it's basically your answer to the question, you know, in this moment, what is your overall feeling of well on a scale from blah to blah? And we've seen in studies that the way that people answer that question, that seemingly very simple, entirely subjective, possibly anecdotal question, is an immensely accurate predictor of overall health and longevity. It predicts longevity up to 96% accuracy. And you couldn't, you know, very few, very few other markers do that. You couldn't take blood pressure or cholesterol level, or any single marker and say, okay, this is going to predict how long you're going to live for with a 96% accuracy. That's wild. That's really wild. And it, I, I really like that idea because it also just speaks true to your intuition and kind of like just being in tune with your body and not necessarily relying on, I guess like data is helpful and biomarkers that you measure are helpful, but there is something to be said about like you kind of know how you're doing if you just tune in and listen to your body, which a lot of us don't. And we just kind of like go day to day without doing that. We can get a much better sense of what's going on without necessarily having all of this like data and tests and things done. Yeah, I love data. The cliche is you can only change things. If you don't measure it, you can't change it. But I think also, I mean, we have to consider what does it mean to to measure something? And we know that data is as is very liable to, to being skewed. I think something that's not talked about, and we're probably not going to talk about it now, but I'm just going to mention it briefly, is the, is the replication crisis. In, in some, somewhere between 50 and 60% of all medical trials cannot be replicated. So, and, we, and, and as replication is the gold standard in healthcare, that basically means somewhere between 50 and 60% of all medical knowledge isn't right. And, and if you allow that to sink in for a minute, that's pretty significant, you know, that at, at least half of the information that doctors and companies use are to base evidence-based decisions is simply not accurate. Wow. Which is pretty yeah. scary. Yeah, that is pretty scary. Yeah, because it kind of makes you question everything you're doing <laughs> and question your results. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess I know one of the things I'd like to do is to re-empower people to, to, to think, okay, well, yes, of course, I want to trust the information, I want to trust the data, I want to trust my doctor, but if half of that information might not be accurate, then I might be trusting myself as well, might be a good thing to do. Yeah, I, I also find just with like, measuring or even this like idea of subjective well-being, like it fluctuates so much for myself. Like, and I even see it in my data. Like even when I measure my HRV, I feel like my HRV is always 
better in the summer when I'm like having more fun and I'm outdoors more and I'm like less inside and not working as much. And then obviously in the winter, it's not as good. Or I just, yeah. And I, it would be interesting to rate myself on this like idea of the scale every day to see the differences day over day and time, like month over month. But I guess the the biggest takeaway is like, if you're constantly feeling like your rating and your number is low, then that's when there's some serious work to do. I think that's right. And and I think, and I'd encourage you to do that and encourage all of us to do that, to rate, to, you know, to rate our subjective well-being day by day and notice how it changes and notice what impact different things that we do have. And you mentioned HRV, but I'm, I'm increasingly convinced that HRV is not the best metric in many ways. I mean, it's, nobody had heard, heard of it five years ago. Now, now, of course, it's been, and it was initially very popular within sport as a way of uh, measuring stamina uh, and resistance, etc. But it's a terribly complex metric. And I think what we're learning is that nobody really understands what it means. And it's so liable to fluctuation from having a cup in an hour's less sleep or having a cup of coffee or being stressed or anxious or your menstrual cycle or you know so many things that interpretation of the data even if the you the means that you're using to collect it is accurate and that's highly debatable data in this what to do with it is not actually i'm waiting for my new aura ring to be activated um, so hopefully someone from aura is listening and they, they can get back to me through customer services and, and sort out my my activation issue but so i, I did have ordered the third generation of aura i, I thought I, I thought i'd better capitulate and, and finally get one i was waiting for the technology to improve but of course i, I have virtually everything that's ever been made that has a, a wearable function or biometric function. And then, so I, I, I have or do monitor my HRV in a number of ways. But I, as I say, I'm less, less interested, really, in HRV. I find heart rate. I think you know, breathing is one of the best indicators, really, because it cha- it, it's also very tied into how we're feeling in the moment. So we, we all know this, right? We all know that we know it, but we, often when it's happening to us, we don't notice it, but we can see it in other people. The breathing is the first thing to change when when our mood or our emotions change. So we we sigh if we're relaxed, we hold our breath if we're tense, and that's why breathing is so important. As both both as a, a way to diagnose and assess how the autonomic nervous system is doing, but also the way in which you can change it. So of course, every meditation, every exercise, every breathing technique, you know, is focused on how we're breathing and how and what we can do about that. How are you taking care of your body when it's worn out and you need a boost in flushing out the bad stuff? Let's face it, our bodies aren't built for the stresses we deal with on a daily basis. Work, stress, exercising, partying, inadequate nutrition, you name it. Our bodies are seriously overworked and it's almost impossible to get all the nutrients we need from diet alone. Instead, you can take a supplement designed to flush out toxins, replenish lost nutrients, and repair cells by taking essentials like antioxidants and vitamins and combining it with cutting edge ingredients like a NAD plus precursor. Coast isn't some basic supplement. It's designed by a cancer researcher and supports two different detoxification pathways in your body, making it highly efficient at flushing out toxins. It is available in a quick and easy shot or powder to mix in water, which is what I take. With nine active ingredients, including the NAD plus precursor, which gets depleted as we age, by the way, glutathione precursor, and more. This is my supplement of choice to combat my daily stress load and promote longevity. You can use my discount code BIOHACKINGBRITTANY in all capitals for 20% off at coastdrink.com. The link will be in my show notes on my website and on my shop page as well for you to find easily. Yeah, I just was thinking back to when I was a kid and like doing speeches in school and trying to take three big breaths and or deep breaths or whatever my parents would say or the teacher would say, and not really fully understanding that at the time, but knowing that it like calmed me down. And that was like a general recommendation to like breathe before you're about to do something that you're nervous for is actually so cool that 
it's that popular that that was recommended back then, but without even understanding the science of it. Like, I don't know, just thinking back on that is like, it's really cool. And then I think now when I'm in moments and I still don't do that (laughs) and I need to be like more conscious of my breath. So well, nothing, nothing yeah. changes how we feel more quickly than how we breathe. But there's a lot of, mis- a lot of misinformation around breathing. So take uh, three breaths, sure. But you know what you, people need to do is they need to breathe out. Yeah, so the mantra that I, you know, and I, actually I don't, I, I, I genuinely can't remember whether I invented this or somebody else did. But the mantra you can use, we can all use pretty much is, if in doubt, breathe out. You'd be amazed, you probably wouldn't be amazed, the level, the epidemic level of breath holding and mouth breathing that goes on. And these are surprisingly critical health altering vectors. You know, people that hold their breath, who therefore have chronically low CO2 hypocapnia, and people who breathe through their mouth rather than their nose, increasing risk of a whole bunch of very serious and life-threatening issues more than they probably suspect. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Just on that note, I, when I was at my dentist, like a couple months ago, I was talking to him exactly about this. And he was explaining that he can tell who breathes through their nose and who breathes through their mouth when they come into his office based on like, jaw structure, teeth structure, how healthy the teeth are, right? Because I guess when you breathe through your mouth, it's just like bacteria in and out the whole time. And it was so fascinating, even from that perspective. And he was saying like, if you want a nice jawline, don't breathe through your mouth because it totally like changes the shape of your face over time. So it was very interesting. Oh, totally. And of course, people who mouth breathe also tend to grind their teeth or clench their jaw, which is a big part of what he's talking about. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Have you found that at all? I don't know if you can track that necessarily, but like with Sensate, if you're using, if you're just sitting there using it, like breathing through your nose versus breathing through your mouth, like, is there any difference there that happens? Yeah, it's interesting. In fact, we were talking about this uh, last couple of days with the team. So when we do demos, again, it's not the sort of thing that people notice. People generally don't know when they're breathing poorly, and or, or even when they they have hypercapnia, which is a form of chronic hyperventilation. Acute hyperventilation is a panic attack, right? But a lot of people have chronic hyperventilation where they're holding their breath or only using some of the lung capacity all the time. But one of the things we were talking about um, was how we've all noticed that when we do demos with even short ones of two or three minutes, or, or what happens in the first two or three minutes is invariably everybody does a big exhalation. They let go and they go, and I'm sure they don't know they're doing it, but the device, the feedback, the resonance from the device is giving the autonomic nervous system, which is, you know, pre-verbal. So it's beyond words. So it's much more than saying to somebody, relax. You know, if you're saying to somebody, relax and breathe out, (laughs) it doesn't doesn't really work, right? Yeah. But um, using signals um, and speaking in the language of the autonomic nervous system directly to it, enables it to let go. Yeah. On that note, can you, for those who don't know, can you kind of explain how Sensate works? Yeah. So there's obviously science and um, engineering behind it. But if, if I start by saying really what it's doing is replicating the very, very natural process that human beings have tried to, uh, and succeeded in doing over thousands of years of making the throat and chest resonate by making sound, by toning. So the different cultures have oming, chanting, singing, mantra, breathing techniques. And, all, and what, these, all, what unites all of these is that they vibrate this column of air that goes down through the throat into the chest uh, and into the diaphragm. And that then, a bit like dropping pebbles in a pond, ripples vibration resonance through the whole body and has a, and if it's the right frequency, because of course you can also have the opposite effect with the wrong frequency. It, it, it relaxes the nervous system and has, creates coherence between all the organs. So Sensei is a two-part system, as you know. It's the pebble itself, which sits on your chest bone and which you then control with the app. So you hear the sound through the headphones or the speaker. And then the different part is the infrasound, the low-frequency sounds, which are conveyed into the body, which you can't hear, but they're conveyed into the body through bone conduction. So these low frequency sounds using bone conduction are going into the thoracic cavity, the hollow part of the chest, and they're turning the chest, turning the body 
into a resonating speaker, very much like the the wooden speaker cabinet around your speaker, right? So you know, you, if you just had a speaker, um, it wouldn't sound it would it would it wouldn't sound very good. It, it's you know, so much of the quality of timbre and resonance uh, and sound reproduction for an expensive hi-fi is the quality of the case, and your chest is that case, and the sensate is the speaker. Yeah, I remember last year when I first started using it, I started doing some research into the vagus nerve and I found it so interesting, kind of like you you mentioned how different things kind of engage it in terms of humming or whistling or singing. And I I love that because I when I think of the times that I do that, right? Like if you're in the kitchen cleaning and you're just like singing like there's this sense of calmness and like happiness that comes from doing that. And it's so interesting just to think about how that's actually helpful and healthy for your body to engage in those like natural things that we do sometimes without even noticing. Like I I just thought that was so fascinating. Yeah. Humming is a fantastic thing and anybody can hum. Again, the frequencies we reproduce are relevant. So there are healing frequencies and some which are less so. I think even somebody isn't a great singer. Most people can actually hum in in tune. And it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? If you imagine somebody in your mind, somebody humming, you probably imagine somebody who's happy and smiling. Yeah. <laughs> and if you, do hum, if you do hum for a few minutes, you probably, it's very hard to, to resist feeling nice and good if you hum a bit. And it sounds easy enough. And of course, all the best things in life really are free, right? Breathing and humming and humming and chanting and uh, being generous and being uh, in love. All these things are, are free, right? But uh, they're surprisingly difficult to do. And, and one of the problems with a technological-based society and a very commercial society is accessing them becomes harder and harder because we all feel so busy. Yes. Yeah. So like when you were on the journey, on your health journey, and you were obviously doing this research and coming up with this idea, like, how did you go from, I want to engage the vagus nerve and make this more accessible to let me develop this pebble product? What was like, how did you do that? What did that look like? Yeah, well, I've been using sound in my work with patients for at least 20 years. And as I say, I noticed that people's ability to practice really became harder and harder, really fell off a cliff. So I would give people exercises and I was like, okay, great, go off and do this and come back. And people became increasingly unable to do the exercises. Even when I started recommending apps and say, okay, go off and use the, you know, the, I'm sure we all know who, the popular apps. So we're going to go off and use these apps. Um, and people would come back and they would often say, well, actually, I try to use the app and I'm just sitting there waiting for it to finish or actually feeling more anxious because the app, the app's asking me to focus on my breathing, focus on how I'm feeling. And the fact is, I feel pretty rubbish. So the more I focus on that, the more it makes me a bit panicky and anxious. Now, some people can go through, they can go and lock themselves away in a retreat somewhere and they can go through that kind of that uh, the, cathartic experience but look that's, that's a hard, that's a big ask and, and a lot of people can't do that so i wanted i've been using sound anyway i was using sound beds built into the treatment couches where people were lying on i was i've been using frequencies my brother's a musician my dad's a musician or was a musician and so i understand music theory uh, and actually i was a musician as well in kind of early punk bands so quite a different uh, quite a different uh, arena but we had some tech that we'd isolated in a clinic that we were working for, a very upmarket clinic in Switzerland. And it was the first kind of convincing technology that I'd come across, a sort of sound bed that really showed uh, promise in terms of being able to change people's mood and behavior and nervous system in a short period of time. And we used that for a long time with patients, and it really helped a lot in all kinds of complex conditions and trauma and PTSD through to chronic inflammatory conditions, etc. And while using this one day, I had this eureka moment where I realized you could turn the body into the hardware. You could get rid of 99% of the hardware. You didn't have to have a huge, a very expensive bed. By taking the resonance from the back, where you're going into muscle, and of course you need very powerful resonance by putting it on the chest. You turn, you use bone conduction to turn the chest into the hardware, and that. And so that was the kind of the eureka moment. That's what's patented, and that's a, a scalable, viable a solution which sends to people in the post. You don't have to. You don't have to come somewhere. You can use it at your own convenience at home. 
And of course, the events of the last couple of years have really proved um, how necessary that is. So, you know, I, 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 development of the sensei really is the is the culmination of my experience in music and then miniaturizing that into a device which people would use on, on their own terms. Yeah. Yeah, that's really awesome. Yeah, like I said, like I love using mine. Do you ever have any kids who use it or yeah, or even teenagers? We definitely do. We legally we can't recommend it for people under 30, but many pay parents tell us or send us pictures of their of their kids are using it. absolutely my oldest son who's now 11 but you know there's never been a great sleeper you know for a long time he could only go to sleep if he had a, a sensate session and we've again lots of parents tell us that they're overstimulated kids with learning issues you know they find it uh, very calming it's tragic actually and it's heartbreaking the the incidence of anxiety in teens and preteens now is huge. And it really upsets me, actually. It's just such a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what I was thinking of is, yeah, I, I just know some kids who have different uh, disabilities and, and learning difficulties. And I just, I feel like they would love something like this because it is a physical product. It's not like you said, it's not just like put this app on and try and meditate. It's something that they could actually feel. But I also understand that you can't necessarily recommend it for people who are too young. But it's, it's interesting that some of your clients kind of do that anyway. Yeah, the, the parents are doing it, which of course, that, that's up to them. I mean, yeah, ask, asking a bit of a slightly hyperactive or anxious child to close their eyes and sit still and notice their breathing. It's, it's unlikely to go well. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I struggle to do it sometimes. So I could only imagine myself when I was younger or like having a disability and trying to do that. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. Do you have anything on the horizon in terms of like new products or new tech that you're developing? I mean, we have a whole product um, roadmap, hardware and software. There is a, a new version of the app. There's a bunch of features to a new content. People have really been screaming at us for a, a while now for more content, more tracks. And we have a whole library and a whole catalog now, uh, but we've really been wait, you know, been developing to try and make sure it's the, the next app tracks that we include in the app are as effective as possible. Particularly what we've been working on is spatialized audio. I don't know if you have familiar you are with that, with what's called 360 sound. No, I, I don't know what that is. Yeah, so Dolby are putting a lot of, put a lot of work into this Dolby Atmos and Apple, they have a whole spatialized audio section on, on iMusic. So it's, we started with mono and then obviously moved over to stereo. Uh, and nobody can imagine what, you know, listening to mono now, right? The spatialized sound is the, is like that, but the next stage on. So, cause, cause of course, you know, stereo is not natural at all. It's not how we hear sound. And the idea of spatialized or 360 sound is that you are hearing things much more closely to how you would hear it in real life. So in, in, a, in like a bubble around you within 360 degrees. So that has, uh, so yeah, so that's, so all the stuff we're working on now, we're, we're recording and mixing in spatialized sounds and that's going to, that's going to help a lot. Uh, and then, then there is hardware as well, but generally when people bring out a new hardware device, uh, phone or whatever, it's because they want people to stop using the previous one because you know, rather not every iteration of a new piece of hardware has, is, is a major improvement on the previous version. But but obviously companies are tied into this uh, model, you know, new model once a year or twice a year even cycle, but you know, for, for for commercial reasons, and um, we constantly sort of improve the hardware. But there's so much scope, and it works, and it's already working so well for so many people. Nowhere near saturation with the the, the number of people that we know could be using it. So so our focus and our passion is in, is improving the current device. But there are a number of other things that we can that we're working on, but we can't really talk about right now. Yeah. I bet. I bet. <laughs> well, I, I look forward to kind of like seeing what comes out in the next few years as I follow your journey. So if people are interested in trying Sensei for the first time, where can they go and how can they connect with you? Well, getsensate.com is the website. So getsensate.com. Obviously, there's a contact um, button within that. I'm sure that we can or have provided you with a code so that your listeners, yeah, can can get it in a special way. You're always happy to do that. You know, it's all, it, for me, it's all about getting uh, Sensei out to as many people as possible. 
Yes. So I'll put it in my show notes, but I do have a discount code for everybody. It's biohacking Brittany in all capitals. And I think it gets you $25 off. And I will make sure I link that on my website as well. So it's super easy for everybody to find and try it because I love it. And obviously you do too. And and so many people do now. So it's really cool. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This was awesome. And I, I really appreciate your time. My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. If you're interested in finding the show notes or the sponsors for this episode, you can do so on my website, which is biohackingbrittany.com. Remember to follow me on Instagram where I'm most active. My handle is at biohackingbrittany. And if you're interested in working together and you want to email me directly, you can do that. My email is info at biohackingbrittany.com. And I look forward to hearing from you and having you tune in next week.